My story starts September 6th, 1943. I was six years old, and September 6th was my first day in my one-room school. It was smaller, the building was, than the surrounding one-room schools. It was white and clapboard, and three big tall windows on each side. And up on the top was the belfry with the bell and the rope going down through into the cloakroom. And then out the back, there were two smaller buildings, also white. It was all bright white, clapboard, and they were the outhouses out and back. If you were to go there, you would have said, how quaint, how charming. But it's gone, and it's just soybeans now. And there's nothing left but memories. This was in, uh, if you went there today, though, and you could go back in time and go into that school, and it was still there, and you were walking the front door, what you would see is a family. It was a family of big kids and little kids. And they were molded together in there and practicing their learning together. The family of big kids and little kids. Now this happened in a very rural area in Southern Branch County. Of all the schools down there, I kind of think mine was the ruralest of the rural. <laughs> it was, um, um, we call it country school. And the name of my school was Bethel Number no. 6. And I'd like to tell you everything. There were a hundred stories, a thousand. But I'm going to tell you just one, and I call it the softball game. When I was in the fourth grade, that would make me a little kid in the fourth grade, there was a new first grader that came to the school. He was small for his age, skinny, um, thin, short, and he um, he uh, had kind of snarly hair, colics, uncombable. And he spoke kind of jerkily, had unusual um, jerky manners about him. And I think that in some modern schools, he might not fit in. But in Bethel number six, everybody fit in. And I think it was because of that family of big kids and little kids. He simply had to join the family, and he'd be okay. Now, his name was Bernard Williams, but he had a nickname that the kids from his neighborhood gave him, and they called him, they called him Bird Turd. I think it was derisive, of course, but it was Bernard, and they made it into Bird Turd. And that was derisive, but by the time he entered school, Bernard and his friends at home used the name without disrespect. And so we all called him Bird Turd. <laughs> Simply his name. <clears throat> Actually, he was a real nice kid, very positive, very cheery smile on his face, upbeat, always found the nice things to say about people and things. But he also talked a lot, chatter, chatter, chatter. I mean, it was a lot. And the only thing you could figure out to do after a while was to simply walk away. Seemed rude, but he didn't seem to mind, so we did. <laughs> And another thing about him was that he would sing to himself softly. 
Most of the time, when he wasn't talking, he'd be singing to himself. Sometimes we would know the tune. Sometimes there wasn't a tune. And even in the classroom, at quiet times, he would hum to himself. We noticed it for a couple of weeks, and then we didn't notice it because it was just nice, pleasant background music. Now also, I think he was a little behind the other kids of his age academically. But it didn't matter, not in that school, because you started where you started and you went as far as you could go. Pretty good concept. Now, outside of the school, outside of the window, there was a softball diamond, ill-kept, weedy, and different from the other schools around us. It was rarely used. You see, I think you have to know that we were pretty good academically in our school. That's my opinion. But athletically and socially, eh, not so good. In fact, I think we might have been Southern Branch County's original nerd school. <laughs> so uh, one day, though, uh, two boys came from a, another school, uh, Maple Grove. And they came to our school, and being the, I don't know, socially inept that we were, it was a big thrill to have somebody come from a, another school to ours, two kids on a bicycle. I mean, it was like somebody from Mars. <laughs> and then what they did is they asked us to play a softball game against them at their school the following Friday. Well, our hearts stopped. We were all excited. And we stood there looking up at our teacher, wondering what his answer would be. It was Mr. Bodley, our teacher. And he hesitated quite a long time until finally he said yes. And then the boys left and we all cheered. And Mr. Bodley, <laughs> he knew we were not ready. We were totally devoid of any athletic ability <laughs> or natural talent or knowledge of the rules. <laughs> Only three of us had gloves. The rest of us had to catch barehanded. We were multiply heighted, some about there, between there, and um, just really a, a rubes, I guess, you know, something that, uh, you know, pretty countryish there. So, uh, so then uh, we had to choose the team. And the team consisted of all the boys from the third through the eighth grade, except one. There was a fourth grader. I'm in the seventh grade by now. And the fourth grader is bird turd. <laughs> he got cut from the team. And Mr. Bodley had a car. He's going to take us over to Maple Grove to play this game. And it's Friday now next Friday. His car is a 1937 Ford, about 12 years old at the time. Little car, small, with these little windows all the way around the car. So we get in the car, three in the front passenger seat, kind of scrunched in there, because it's a small seat, and myself and five others are in the back seat, and we're scrunched in there. And we're looking out these little windows out of the car. And we're starting to move down the driveway out from Bethel number six. And I look out the side window. Bird turd is there. He's left behind. He's got to stay with the girls and the first and second graders. He's looking at me. And I'm looking out at him. And he's got a big smile on his face. And he's waving his arms, and he's really happy, and he's cheering us on, and he kind of runs beside the car. 
as we go along. He's very happy. And when we get out on the dirt road, I look out the back window and he's still coming behind us, waving his arms and he's cheering us on and I watch him until he disappears into the dust. Also back there is home turf. Now home turf is where you can accentuate your swagger, you know. <laughs> to get the picture, you've got to imagine me this tall doing this because that was what we were doing. We're swaggering because we had this confidence that we were going to vanquish Maple Grove. Back at Bethel number six, we were infinitely confident that we could beat Maple Grove. But Maple Grove is another story. We're pulling into their driveway And it's like nine wide-eyed deer in the headlights. Now, you probably know about that rule they have nowadays, where if you're in a ball game and you get a lot of points behind, they stop the game and the other team wins. They didn't know about that rule. Southern Branch County. But I know now why they call it the mercy rule. <laughs> we lost 51 to 1. <laughs> I wish I had a better memory because I really would like to know how it was that we scored that one. <laughs> now, I was in the seventh grade then, and a year later, I'm in the eighth grade. And we played Maple Grove again. But in the meantime, Mr. Bodley coached us twice a week, and even more often, as game day arrived. And we learned how to hit and run and throw and catch. And we studied the softball rooms in the classroom. And we got uh, some uh, uh, things for ourselves, like uh, gloves. We all had gloves now. And uh, we learned how to uh, catch a fly ball and where to throw it after we caught it. And practice the double play and the run down. And that coaching was from first grade through the eighth grade. And it included Bertrand. Now Bertrand, he was fifth grade now, but still very small for his age. But he made the team. So we had to kind of watch how he was doing. And he couldn't throw. He couldn't throw accurately. When he ran, it was comical. And when a fly ball came to him, the ball would ricochet through his arms and off his chest and through his legs onto the ground, and then he would kick the ground. <laughs> and then he'd smile. Every time, the ball would come down through his arms, ricochet off his chest, fall between his legs, and he would kick the ground, and then he would smile. <laughs> a fly ball, ever. But you know Bird Turd already. He was our cheerleader. And he played right field. Of course, right field. And it, I swear, it was noisy out there because that's who Bird Turd was. Now this time, going over to Maple Grove, it was a little quieter. We were contemplating and kind of worrying. But Billy Russell slammed a leadoff home run for our side. And in the bottom of the, sec uh, the first inning, Bird Turd caught a fly ball. It was the only time he ever caught a fly ball. And his smile was as wide as his face 
and his chatter was much louder after that. And our confidence soared so that by the end of the first inning, we led by two to one. And by the end of the third inning, we led by three to one. And by the end of the fourth inning, they went ahead by one. And by the end of the fifth, we went ahead by one. So it was a seesaw game, back and forth. But in the end, we lost again. 13 to 14. 13 to 14? <laughs> so now we're back in Mr. Bodley's small car. We're headed back to Bethel number six. And it was quiet at first. We were all scrunched in, as usual. Bird turd was being between two bigger kids and his face was like this. And it was quiet for a minute. Maybe two. I don't know. And then I heard Bird Turd say, oh, I feel pretty good. And he said it brightly. And I had to think to myself, even though we lost the game, I felt pretty good too. And I looked around. And most everybody was smiling, including Mr. Bodley. And then I looked over at my old friend, Bird Turd, with the funny hair. And while I was looking at him, he started singing. So we all joined in. Thank you. <laughs> 